Okay, we still have a couple of people out there getting food, but I think we're going to go ahead so we don't get behind schedule. Um, thank you all for uh, sticking with us and being here for the keynote presentation uh, uh, this afternoon. Before we begin that, there's still a few elected officials with us in the room. If you are an elected official, would you please stand up? Would everybody give them a round of applause? We can't do this work without making sure that we get the policy changes and the funding decisions that we need to make it work. And having this many elected officials with us this week has been, I think, incredibly important. Um, and we can, you know, we intend to continue uh, having those conversations over the next two years. Thank you all who have been here. Uh, we have a really special uh, video right now. And I don't know if Bob Sonicson is still in the room. He's a staff person for Senator Crapo. And uh, Senator Crapo, many of you may know, has been supportive of our rail efforts for some time. And uh, his staff worked with us to make sure that we uh, got this greeting from him that, that expressed his support for our efforts. So I'm gonna cue a video by Senator Crapo. Hi. I'm U.S. Senator Mike Crapo. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you as part of the Greater Northwest Passenger Rail Summit. I hope your time in Boise will be a fruitful discussion of the importance of rail infrastructure to the Pacific Northwest economic region. Today, you will have the opportunity to discuss a number of issues related to the restoration, expansion, and enhancement of passenger rail services across the region. I understand the importance of having reliable public transportation available in rural areas and have long supported the return of passenger rail service to Southern Idaho. I will continue to engage with my colleagues and the administration to support the return of the Pioneer Line. Reinstating the Pioneer Line has many benefits for Idaho to include connecting it with the national passenger rail system, adding travel options, and increasing mobility for citizens and enhancing economic and community development along the route. As conversations about the rail expansion continue, regional and local feedback is crucial to demonstrating the expansive need Idaho has for additional improvements and return of passenger rail service through Boise. Please continue engaging with members of Congress and our staff to highlight the many benefits passenger rail networks have to your communities. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Crapo, and thank you to uh, the Senator staff for helping make that video happen. It's pretty exciting to have that kind of support uh, for those of us in Idaho. I think it's gonna be very uh, helpful going forward to uh, ensuring that, that we're successful. So I've known John Robert Smith for a very long time, but uh, I've also known Charlie Hamilton now for about three years. Um, when we started talking about passenger rail, I turned to John Robert and one of the people he put me in touch with was uh, all aboard Washington and included in that was Charlie Hamilton. And the efforts that they've put into helping organize the people in the Northwest, um, this summit uh, last year, or the summit in Billings, um, all of those have been incredibly important and, and the people that um, ha have made that happen include Charlie Hamilton and the rest of the crew at All Aboard Washington. So Charlie, I'd like to welcome you to the stage to um, introduce our keynote speaker today, John Robert Smith. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. One of the reasons that I'm involved in rail advocacy is for those of us who are part of the 30% of the population that does not drive, because some of us are too young, too young, too old, too poor, disabled, like I am, so that that's why I'm not on the stage. Um, it's really important uh, for that group and also for the folks who choose not to drive just because they're concerned about the future of the planet. And so it gives me great pleasure to uh, talk about our speaker who is uh, John Robert Smith, 
who's the uh, chairman of the board of Pet Transportation for America. He's worked with T4A for 14 years. He's very proud of the work that T4A has was done. It did to include a lot of the uh, in, uh, sections of the IIJA, uh, now the bipartisan infrastructure law that a lot of folks have been talking about, all the grants that are now available. And uh, so it has been uh, an incredible uh, transformation of the um, of the support uh, for federal uh, support and specifically rail. Prior to uh, John Roberts' uh, stint at uh, T4A, he was an elected leader in Meridian, Mississippi for 20 years, 16 of which he was the uh, city's full-time mayor. During that time, Meridian built a multimodal transportation hub that has brought amazing results to the city's investment. John Robert also served on the board of Amtrak and uh, of the head of the board of Amtrak during the period that the Acela equipment was coming into service. He worked with the um, Amtrak staff to focus on improving the onboard experience for passengers through such initiatives as bringing in professional steps, staff, uh, chefs to improve the quality of food service. John Robert also serves as an advisor to the Southern Rail Commission, which was the first interstate rail compact, uh, and you'll be hearing more about that in the next session. I've had the great good fortune to have uh, regular communication with John Robert, and I learn something new every time I talk to him. And so I'm sure we'll all learn something new today. So please welcome John Robert Smith. Charlie, thank you for that kind introduction. I do appreciate it. And I also learned from you, Charlie. And I want to thank all of you for the opportunity for me to be here and be a part of this important summit on passenger rail. And it gives me another good reason to be in Boise. I told the mayor, I uh, told Mayor McLean last night that the first time I was in Boise was in 2001. And the US Conference of Mayors was having their annual meeting here. I had just been elevated to uh, chairman of the board of Amtrak at that time. And with the president of Amtrak, George Warrington, we worked to put together the demonstration train that some of you still remember um, here in Boise that took us on an evening's trip to uh, a destination uh, not too far removed over freight tracks that had never seen superliner equipment on that track before, at least not anyone's living memory. And we brought the chefs, and that was, these are not microwave operators. These are chefs from the Empire Builder, the City of New Orleans, and the Cressa to prepare meals and serve to the mayors. Now, this was not just a luxury fun trip for the mayors. It had a design because the administration at the time in the White House was zeroing out all funding for passenger aid. Well, I wanted to convert those mayors that were in attendance into believers in the future of passenger rail, its quality as it existed, but what it could mean for their downtowns. And of course, most of those mayors had never ridden on a passenger train, much less a long distance passenger train. So after that event, we sent some 400 mayors back out into their communities now believing and more than just believing, picking up the phone and calling their senators and congressmen and saying, this is important to me and my people in my hometown. And actually from that time to now, um, my work has mostly been about how we build our cities and towns so that they're resilient places and our people can get to the daily needs of life and how we connect those vibrant places by alternative means to an automobile. If we only give people one choice for transportation, did we give them a choice? So I think there are redundant forms of transportation that fit the needs of various people in our communities. And that's what 
we've been about. And I've been doing that with Smart Growth America, which at its simplest, we simply believe that whoever you are and wherever you live, you deserve the right to live in a place that's resilient and that is prosperous and that you and your children are healthy. And Transportation for America, and some of you are members of Transportation for America. You can join as chambers, you can join as uh, MPOs, individual cities, towns. We're bringing the local voice into the conversation of transportation connectivity. And I also do work here traveling to cities and towns about how you rebuild your downtown and how you uh, build the heart of your community. That work's taken me to over 140, I've lost count now, um, over the past 14 years. Uh, 140 places providing technical assistance to those. And I wanna give you an opportunity here. This is a possibility. It's for communities that are roughly 50,000, could be a little less, up to 500,000. Our work is funded by Robert Woods Johnson. They endow us to provide free, free technical assistance to communities that are facing an issue where some form of transportation infrastructure uh, is dividing their community. I'll give you an example. Gretna, Louisiana, their main street in Gretna has a Union Pacific freight train that comes down the middle of it. And for the 12 to 20 minutes that that train is on the track, no fire truck, no ambulance. You can't back out of your driveway. And this is the very main artery of Gretna. So Gretna is working with the freight. They're gonna move the freight line. The technical assistance is how do you begin to, to discuss what you do with this new benefit you have of this right of way to use and make it bikeable and walkable and transit friendly? So these are the kind of discussion. This is an easy, easy application to fill out. It's due the 28th, but it's plenty of time to fill it out. You just have to tell a story of it could be a highway, it could be an off ramp, it could be a uh, rail infrastructure, what infrastructure is dividing your people, dividing your community, an impediment to the progress of your community. And when we talk about divisive infrastructure, who do we build this for? We build it for asphalt and concrete, and like anything in this country, we we started a highway system that connected us. That was a wonderful thing. We tend to overdo. And we have this kind of infrastructure. Who are, we, who are we building for? Are we building for those vehicles? Or are we building for people? You know, transportation is moving people. Yes, moving goods. But for our conversation, moving people from place to place. And some of those people have limited mobility. We have an aging population, they'll be limited. We have children, they're limited. So again, it's about choice. And when we deny choice and we give them only the automobile, you get images like this. After Katrina, you all watched on TV as the people of New Orleans walked down the interstate because they had no other way to get out of New Orleans. 70% of the population doesn't own an automobile. No rail, no way out of New Orleans. That's what happens. I want to show you a quick little video. Um, Senator, uh, President James Knox Polk in Congress had just acquired the Oregon Territory and California. They needed to inhabit it with Americans, which at that time were people who lived east of the Mississippi River. He needed to occupy it before the Brits could push south out of Canada into the Oregon Territory, or Spain could continue to push into the California ter Territory. So what you're going to see is a map that unfolds from the 1880s to the creation of Amtrak. It's a stunning image. I hope you get to see it. <laughs> So Polk gave the railroads and Congress 
180 million acres, 180 million acres, if they would push west. Um, the caveat was you have to take human beings. Now, John Jacob Astor developed his fur trade based on those railroads expansion west and the $180 million worth of. So you see it develop, get more and more robust, and then you see it begin to disappear until you are where you are with Amtrak service when it was created. Did you see how this nation invested and when the freights pushed west, they fully filled the map, including where we are today. And then of course, with the interstate highway system, you began to see the redundancy of passenger rail evaporate from that map. Now the next map picks up where this one ends. So this is taking from when Amtrak was initiated in 7071, and the blue lines are the frequencies, but you see they begin to pull from uh, the system that they were given by the freights. And right, I'm gonna move to the next one. All right. And of course the Northwest suffered worse than any other part of the country. And when I was appointed to the Amtrak board, I can remember, uh, of course, I had to make my hill rounds and Senator Wyden you know, still was so adamant that the pioneer needed to be restored. Uh, and of course, this station that we visited last night lost that service. And as we look at the present uh, map of Amtrak, we are all familiar with the huge gaps that exist really on the other side of Chicago until you get to the, to the California coast. You're especially impacted by that. But the good news is the possibilities are virtually endless. This is the freight infrastructure in the country today. Almost any one of those could accept passenger rail and I would argue would be very good for the freight as well as for the traveling public. And you have your wish list. This map on the right is pulled from an Amtrak map. You know, initially when there were, the corridor program was announced, states and others sent in corridors they would like to see instituted. Map on the right is what came from this part of the country. And you have even a fuller vision for passenger rail throughout the Northwest. Now, is this vision more robust than can actually be accomplished? Probably so in the immediate future, but you've got to dream big, folks. You can't dream small. Now, you have the fact that the IIJA, the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was passed. And uh, as Charlie mentioned, we had a lot to do, worked for five years in drafting uh, language on passenger rail in that bill. And of, you see, we've pulled out the, of the infrastructure part of the bill, we've pulled out the transportation side. That's roughly $650 billion, certainly, Five, almost 500, I mean, 450 million go into highways, but you've got passenger rail, you've got rail with over 100 billion folks, billion. You know, when I was on the Amtrak board, we were talking about luckily getting 1.3 million initially, and then that grew to 1.2 billion. But you're talking about $100 billion. And to give you an idea of how much of a move it was from the FAST Act on top to the Infrastructure Act on the bottom, I mean, it's an exponential increase for the Northeast card, but especially for uh, the national system, which is long distance and state support. And three major programs there between Amtrak funding, the Chrissy Grant for infrastructure, a little sliver for r and &E grants to help pay for operating, but then a big, big chunk under the federal state partnership for inner city passenger rail. And we'll talk more about that. But don't think this is safe. 
more than a third of this is subject to annual appropriations. Now, did that? Did you break a sweat when you realized that? Um, and I would say that the infrastructure funding for passenger rail in this bill shouldn't be seen as the ceiling. It should be seen as the floor for investment in passenger rail in this country. Don't think of this just as a one-time largesse. This should be the floor. So how have things changed in Congress? Well, on the House side, you have no longer Chairman DeFazio. You have Chairman Sam Graves from Missouri and, and uh, Congressman Larson from Washington. But you saw what the House just did. I mean, if, if that stands, they have gutted all passenger rail and a huge chunk out of long distance the state supported as well as uh, the Northeast Corridor. And on the Senate side, you still have uh, Maria Cantrell as chair, but we've lost Senator Wicker as ranking member. And Senator Wicker was the champion for all of that good language we worked on in IIJA for passenger rail. He's gone to Armed Services Committee, and Senator Cruz is now a ranking member uh, on Senate Commerce. And we have begun to work with Senator Cruz as well, because some of Senator Wicker's staff on Commerce remain with Senator Cruz. And um, some of his first letters coming out as chair have been positive letters we can work with. So we're going to take uh, Senator Cruz as a project. And I think we can, we're working with folks in Texas to make it real for him. But it's more than just money, folks. It's a change in attitude by Congress towards passenger rail. It requires a new direction on the board of directors for Amtrak and new board members. It's supposed to be diverse by type of rail service and diverse by geography. And this is where I'm so disappointed with the current administration. Of the nominees to the board, there is not one west of the Mississippi River or south of Maryland. Now that's 44 states on this continent that don't have a voice. And of those that are nominated, one's from Illinois, Mayor Chris Coos, normal Illinois, he's gonna be a good board member. The others may be fine, but they all come from four states on the Northeast, Maryland, uh, Delaware, New Jersey, and New York. They don't have a clue of what it's like out here. The, with all due respect, the chairman of the board who's been there 12 years answered Senator Tustin, no, he's never been to Montana or Idaho. That means he's never been on the Empire Builder, which is one of their premier long uh, service trains. We want board members that represent the country, that understand that the great Northwest is frontier country still that the South is rural and we have different issues and bring that to the board. And Senator Tester has stopped the nominations cold because of that fact. Uh, what's even more important is IIJA takes the focus from profit for Amtrak to service. Everywhere in the bill, it said Amtrak will be judged on how much of the, how close they are to paying for themselves. That's been changed to they'll be judged on how they serve the country, urban and rural, all parts of the So that's, and, and take the bill, go through it. You'll find that true in every case. Um, and a real strong focus on the national network. And then of course, there are two programs I'm gonna get into that, that are key for you all. Uh, compacts and corridors, and you're going to hear more about that in the, the next panel, uh, provide advice for the Southern Rail Commission. Now, you may think you've got a tough sale on passenger rail here in the Northwest. Now, folks, I'm talking about Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. Um, you make the sale on return on investment. 
you make the sale on what it brings to the localities that are served. And look at the robust visions out of the Southern Rail Commission, and I'll talk a little bit about the successes they've had. The Interstate Rail Compact, this was language we specifically wrote for this bill, creates 10 compacts. Why 10 compacts? Why not five, six? Well, the Southern Rail Commission has three states in it. With three states, I've got six senators. If every commission has an average, some will be two states, some might be four or more. If every commission has an average of three and you do 10, now I've got 60 senators. I can do business with 60 senators. That's why 10 is chosen. And the Southern Rail Commission has moved from an eating, drinking, and meeting society to a, to, which is, and if they were sitting there, they'd tell you they were. But, and they were established by Congress in 1982. The governors of the three states appoint them, and then they serve independently after that. But look at the wins they've had. Gulf Coast service between New Orleans and Mobile is going to be a reality. And it has been 17 years in restoring it after Katrina, but it's going to be four trains a day. It's going to provide $240 million to the state of Mississippi every year in additional revenue. To one county in Mississippi, it's going to provide $90 million in increased revenue every year. Now you've got an argument to make with a, anyone, but certainly a conservatives looking, if, if I spend Mississippi my $14 million one time, and with a 10% increase in tourism, I can get $240 million a year. That's a, that's a project I'm willing to put my money in. So that's going to start um, probably in the first quarter of next year. Baton Rouge to New Orleans, I showed you those people walking down the interstate. Now they're going to have a train that can take them out. 800 people at a trip. Um, it'll be a lifesaver for Baton Rouge to New Orleans. And then Amtrak has agreed and did apply for a Fed State Partnership grant to take the Crescent, which comes to Meridian, and split it in Meridian and take a section over to Dallas-Fort Worth. And Amtrak applied for that Fed State Partnership grant, along with great support from those of us in that area. But that's what you can do if you have the will to do it. And look at the connectivity they will have. The airport in New Orleans will be the only airport in this country, and maybe in the world, connected by three long distance trains, two state supported trains, um, and a local transit network that fills that last mile gap. That's how they're thinking about this and positioning themselves. And the card identification program is this opening for you that you're gonna hear more about, but. FRA said, ask for the carders. Be bold in your thinking because each carder selected will receive $500,000 in funding for you to then begin your real serious work in planning and schedule planning. And you can also be, it will move you to the top of the list for other federal funding. Now, there is no free funding out there. Uh, it, Everything requires a match. Uh, doesn't require a match for operating on the long distance. But we've got the, you heard from the long distance uh, study group day before yesterday, I think. And you were informed that the study is going to be a year late. Think of all of the notices of funding availability for Chrissy and Fed State Partnership and CARTA, all those other things that will come and go without the long distance plan to support it. So this, this is a problem. But with the long distance, let's say your service is selected as one of the long distance services that should be invested in, in this country. If it's long distance, you won't pay operating support. But it puts you in a funding stream for grants for the capital investment. So the Fed State Partnership you take your long distance designation, you're in that pipeline, but you're going to have to have local and state non-federal match to draw down construction dollars. The reason this is easier for you is because you're not asking your state to support 
operating expense, but capital expense built into freight rail right of way, it's going to be good for the freights, and more of them are beginning to see this, as well as for the passenger rail. So I tell you all this to say that conferences and monthly meetings are important, but you can't stop there. Now is the time you have to act. The funding is not secure forever. The notices are rolling out the door almost every day from FRA. They're trying to get the money out. You've got to be prepared to be that player. Well, how do you do it? Well, first of all, you're identifying those infrastructure projects that you need, you know you need within the, the route that you're promoting. And you've done so much of that already, and I salute you for that. Second thing is grade crossings. Your states get grade crossing safety money every year, and there are grade crossing safety grants they can apply to the uh, feds for. And you've all got crossings that need to be addressed now. Maybe it's bars, lights, um, signals that are crossing, what we see more normally. Maybe it's much more ambitious with uh, a grade separation. Or on the left is what Mayor Coos did in Normal, Illinois. That's a bike ped crossing underneath the freight railroad to connect two sides of his community together. That funding is available now, and those projects should be identified and you should be acting on them now. Station plans. You might say, well, we can't plan a station if we don't have a train. Well, yes, you can, because we worked with Gonzalez in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and they applied for a raise grant, got $20 million to build those two stations, and there isn't a passenger train running there yet. You've got a freight railroad that says we will operate it. You've got Amtrak saying we want to serve it, but you can begin to plan the station and all that is incorporated in it and how it lays out into your downtown now. And there's funding for it. And yes, if you're the local, you're gonna have to put up some match, but it can be some in kind. You can put up the property. So be imaginative and get that work underway. And also capacity. This is an image of what the Long Bridge will look like when it connects DC to Virginia. It eases um, the congestion on the freight railroad, but it, it allows the Northeast corridor, the state supported trains in Virginia and the Crescent long distance train to travel in and out of this region very seamlessly. Those are projects you can be working towards. Again, remember the possibilities are virtually endless with hard work and drive and realizing where the freight can win as well, you can do this, but it's more than connectivity. As much as I've talked about it, it's more than connectivity, it's about identity. This is downtown Meridian. We built this in my first term in office. For every dollar we put into the station you see in the upper uh, right, for every dollar we put into that project, it has leveraged over 167 additional dollars invested in that downtown. Um, it's more than connectivity, it's about opportunity. Uh, looking at the Missoula train station there, what a tremendous opportunity to lift that whole part of your city and your county and the region that you serve. The other is the Rio Grande plan for a Salt Lake City, Utah. There already uh, making those plans, cementing that vision, and a vision propels people. That's how you, you've got to show them something. You just can't talk about it. People have to have something they can either see or touch or feel to be real. And then it's more than connectivity. It's about the next generation. So let me close that you know, Southerners at our core are storytellers whether through literature or music or theater, we're storytellers. Well, I'm blessed to have four grandsons. And when I'm able to spend time with them, they want to hear stories. Now we have reading stories, but then we have telling stories. And their favorite are the telling stories. So the little ones will pile in bed with me 
And they'll want to hear the stories that my grandmother told me. And they'll want to hear about Aunt Allie and the wildcat that jumped on the back of her horse. And they'll want to hear the story of the wild man of Lost Gap. Now, Google it. That's a true story. Now, all my stories start in the truth, but I do embellish them from time to time. They'll want to hear those stories, but then they'll also say, well, what was it like when you were a boy, Paca? That's what they call me, Paca. And they'll laugh at the notion of a phone with a cord on it connected to the wall. What a silly thing. But then they'll be envious of being able to walk down as a child by yourself to the corner drugstore and get a milkshake. One night before that little one there drifted off to sleep, he looked up at me and he said, Paca, what's it going to be like when I get big? See, that's what our work is doing. We're answering that little boy's question. Yet the transportation system that exists right now is going to last fine for me for the rest of my life. Uh, I wish it were going to be longer. But it, it's going to carry me well, as much as I need. It's not going to carry him. And the decisions and the effort we're putting forth today is going to predict and determine whether he can find a vibrant life in his hometown in Mississippi or Louisiana, in a small place, in a more rural environment. Is he going to find that kind of connectivity and energy and sense of place that connects him to health care and to education and to his family and to other opportunities and a job? Is he going to find that? Well, he's not if we remain idle. So I just want to leave you with the thought that your work's going to take a long time. It's going to be hard, but you are building a foundation that his life will be able to leap from. I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, John Robert. That was that was fantastic. I'm Dave Strohmeyer with the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority in Montana. John Robert, could you just say a few words about what helped turn the corner in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama as far as moving away from a maybe a mentality of scarcity to one in which those states feel as if they ha actually have the capacity to have some skin in the game? Well. Most states are experiencing and have experienced um, in the past two or three years or so surplus, budget surplus. So what do you do with that budget surplus? Do you invest it in a project that's going to propel your state further into this century? Are we going to, it, if we're satisfied in Mississippi with being now third from the bottom in education and all these other issues we weren't winning the title of. If we continue to do things the same way we've been doing them, we're going to stay there. So we've got to think differently. So we went to, we energized the local electeds so that they understood the impact of choice. It's a local transit. It's passenger rail. They then moved their um, first move Congress, I can move Congress easier than I can move the Mississippi legislature. Really, I mean, uh, and, and we've been pretty productive in doing that. Uh, but you empower those at the local level, you base it on the return on investment. So I was telling your chamber exec here, when we wanted to run the numbers of financial impact to do it, and we're in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama, who did we hire? we hired the Trent Lott Institute of Economic Development at the University of Southern Mississippi. No one could say that was a liberal think tank. And when they returned numbers, like I mentioned to you, of 90 million to Harrison County, all of a sudden Harrison County, that's an annual return. We want some of that. You know, we think about an interstate, they'll say, oh, we're going to put an interchange here and think of all the economy that will grow around that interchange. That train station is an interchange on this interstate of steel, and you can show the return on investment beyond the building of it, beyond the buying of goods and services that the train lead, purely on additional dollars spent, and that's how we turned that. And then, of course, 
each is a little different. In Louisiana, it's about, okay, the whole place is sinking and you have storms that are going to hit you every year and you have people who still to this day can't get out of New Orleans. So this is a lifeline that we put together because uh, I just left the board and David Gunn, who was president of Amtrak, we put together a relief train from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. 800 people a day, uh, our trip, four round trips a day, that's moving a good number of folks out after Katrina. Um, on, ran the first train, New Orleans only loaded 28 people. And then the mayor of New Orleans, who by the way was in Houston, Texas, he wasn't in New Orleans, said, we'd rather keep him in the Superdome. Well, you know how that worked out for people in the Superdome. So for New Orleans and Baton Rouge, it's a resiliency issue, it's a life safety issue. This train will go directly, one of the stops will be to the three major hospitals in Baton Rouge so that you can empty beds out of New Orleans and move them to Baton Rouge. So each service has a little different application to it. And for workers in Gonzales, they need to be able to get the people, because you don't live around the um, gas and, and uh, oil in, uh, industry. You live elsewhere and you go to work there at the plants. Well, they've got to have a way to get people in and out. And Gonzalez is the jumping off point for a lot of that. So this passenger rail is that kind of connectivity. You've got the story with the airport in New Orleans. Huge difference maker that will make. Uh, and here you have different issues. You, know, you, you drive longer distances to get places that in the east, I don't have a car, I hadn't had a car in 14 years, don't miss all of that expense whatsoever. A lot better shape because I don't have it. Um, but it would take me, you can drive 100 miles as long as it'd take me to drive into DC. So there's each, your story is different in, with every route you're envisioning. Does that answer the question? And then once you make it a return on investment issue, it's, how do you say I'm going to spend 14 and I'm going to get 240 back every year as a state? Other questions? And, and don't believe, I, do not tell me you can't do that up here. I, I'm as, in about as conservative, and I was a Republican mayor for 16 years in a city that was 65% African-American. If you're serving your population, it doesn't matter. And if we can make these cases in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama's always been a more difficult sell. But if we can do that, you can, you can do this here. And we're talking about investments in infrastructure, not talking about initially investments in operating. I think your long distance will be such a success. You're gonna start looking at, well, I wish I had some shorter connections like some of the corridors you're looking at. And you can get an r and &E grant where the feds will pay 90% of the operating loss the first year and it diminishes over a six year period and understand every form of transportation in the world that carries a human being does not pay for itself out of the fare box. When I fly home to DC tomorrow, if my ticket had to include the air traffic control system, the TSA agents, building the airport in DC, building the runways, that ticket would be tens of thousands of dollars. No, the federal government does all of that. The Delta Airlines is gonna have me a seat in some peanuts. Highways, only 40%, the gas tax you pay only builds out 40% of the highways. Where does the rest of it come from the general fund? I pay into the general fund through my tax. I don't have a car. So I'm paying for something I'm not using. So John Robert, we have a, a diverse audience here. We have folks from MBOs, we have some elected officials, we have some advocates, we have some local government um, folks who work for different agencies. Tell, little bit of advice to each of those groups. What are the things they can do 
to move this forward. We know we all have to work in collaboration, but everybody has a little bit of a job. And I think it would help to hear from you the kinds of things you've seen that makes that successful. So I'll start at the state level and work backwards. So at the state level, understand that as infrastructure is built, it may be 80% federal or 90% federal in some rare cases, uh, there's a match that goes with that. But 80 cents on the dollar of someone else's money, uh, that's a pretty good bargain. That's something you can leverage there, especially when you compare it to the return on investment you're talking about. So the, the state um, understand that this is a great opportunity for you as state legislators. You might want to pull together as a caucus those of you at the state level who have those similar interests based on your district of that may be part of this passenger rail solution. You could look for a funding stream for rail investment in your state, freight and passenger, that's ongoing over the years. So it's not an annual, you know, wringing of hands and gnashing of teeth to see if you're going to get any funding for it. But first of all, understand the impact it can have and you don't want your part of the world left out. At the local level, I tell mayors all the time, if I give you a train tonight and I step off in the morning, how am I connected to the rest of your community? Is there a transit connection that connects me to where I wanna go? We've got to think of transportation as from front door to destination back to front door. So that's a transit issue. It's an MPO issue. It's a bike head issue. Can I step off the train? Can I walk to the hotel safely? If I'm in a wheelchair or I'm blind, can I make, can I traverse that? Um, those are questions you need to be asking and answering for the people who live here already. But it's certainly going to be important um, as you plan out passenger rail. Did that cover? You know, it's your land use, it's what you encourage in your downtown, and it's the story you're telling to the people who visit. And that's the first thing you've got to understand is you have a distinct story. Now you got to find it, but you got to tell it. People want that service station on the interstate, that doesn't define Boise. Well, they got those all over the country and they all look the same. And I'm driving down the interstate and I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen much of the place that I'm in. Passenger rail does that for you. Transit does that for you when you get there. And one of the, when I showed you the pictures of downtown, one of those is the Mississippi Art and Entertainment Experience. It tells the artistic genius of Mississippians. Now you may laugh at that, but if you read 20th century or American lit, you're reading almost exclusively Mississippi authors. We, there was an ad, one of the best ads I've seen for a state. The ad says, Mississippi, yes, we can read. Some of us can even write. And you have Eudora Welty, you have um, Shelby Foote, you, you have William Falk, I mean, triple rank of Mississippi authors, some of which you don't even know are from Mississippi. And another one said, um, you may think we talk funny, but the world dances to our music. Father of country music, father of rock and roll, the jazz, blue, all of that evolves out of Mississippians. So it's important to tell that story because we have a negative story that's justified. I want to believe we have moved past that, but we have a great story of artistic genius that's black and white and all levels of the community. So you get, you get to tell that kind of story. And that's what we're selling when you come to the downtown now. And we purposefully have located them all within the easy walks for children or adults. Thank you. Thank you, John Robert. I always love to hear the stories about other places and we all have them about our own. I, I really love the ones about Mississippi because we often think about other places and, and we have a maybe pejorative 
um, idea about what they really are. And, and it's great to hear that uh, a lot of times that's mistaken. Probably see some of that with our own places. We have a little bit of a break. Come back here at 145. Please don't miss this last panel. It's gonna be really important to learn how we can do interstate compacts um, or a corridor commission perhaps, but something in this region that will help us organize in a way that is more meaningful for the various um, bureaucracies that we have to work with and the various things that we have to overcome because we'll have to do it together in order to be successful. So see you back here at 145. <laughs>